associated with Wes Anderson, who's a genius, and wait till you see this. If you haven't seen it, it's a Meisterwerk. It really is a masterpiece, and uh, I'm just lucky once in my life to be associated with anything like this. Everything Wes make visually amazing, but it's, it's always a story, and, and music, everything combined make it so special. So I hope people appreciate and also get curious about Japan. This film is, is kind of a crazy endeavor, and it's a crazy film because it's just got so many layers. I mean, so many people who've been seeing it keep saying, I need to see it again, because it's just, it's just, it's, it's a visual feast, but it's also got a real heart to the story, and there's also a lot of layers to the story that you start to realize. I think this festival represents true Austin, independent, principled. I think it's got a great spirit, and I think the festival reflects the city really nicely. I'm going to bring the filmmakers out now. Well, let's start with the man himself, Wes. Come on out here. Great work, buddy. So I first you. met you in 1992 at the Sundance yeah. Film Festival. I was there with El Mariachi, and you were there, wasn't it the short film version of Bottle Rocket? I think? That's right, yeah, yes, a long, We were both long really time. shy, not looking at anybody, going like, what are we doing here? Well, you were already, a, you were really a star by then. I mean, I was much uh, the movie lower already under the radar. Right, right, but you were, I remember we were just, just so quiet. We, I'm sure we, neither one of us thought we'd still be here 25 years later. But. Definitely not. Um, I want to bring, I want to ask you first, uh, what inspired you to create this film? I knew you did Fantastic Mr. Fox. Uh, did you know you wanted to jump right into another animated film, or was this just the story bit you first, or what? Well, it was. I, in fact, the way this movie really started was on the on the way to the studio in London, where we made uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox. There was a sign for uh, a road to a place called Isle of Dogs in in London, and I never knew what it was. It just sounded so mysterious. I really liked the idea of Isle of Dogs. What could be on it? Isle of Dogs? It turns out to be not a very nice place. Uh, uh, I went to visit it. It's kind of like a shipping yard. Now, but it, but then I read about it. It was like the king's the place where the king kept his hunting dogs, and it was just all dogs. Um, but that was really the beginning of the movie, was seeing that sign. I, I really love just the artistic collective you've gathered around yourself, both in the writing, the production, the actors. Let's bring some of them on out here. When to bring them on out. Who we got? It. Yes, who's, who's, is, there, is, any, is anybody on this side? Nobody over there. Bill, are you over there? <laughs> over there. No, Bill Murray, ladies here. and gentlemen. Yeah. Kun, you can come out too. Yeah, Bob Balaban. Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Come, take, come take a chair here. Have a seat, have a seat. You sure? you guys, please. Grandmaster over here. <laughs> Grandmaster doesn't sit. <laughs> so they probably, you had to probably bring them on early on in the process. Did you? Oh, more chairs. There you go. There's Jeremy, our producer there. Is that everybody we got? Yeah. Did you write the roles with, with your, I mean, you have such a terrific repertory of actors. Did you, do you think of them now when you write or can not, not think of them? Or did you write this first? Well, then th this one, not so much. This one, we were really, J I wrote it with uh, Jason Schwartzman and Roman Coppola, and we're very old friends. Yeah, those are good guys. Um, and um, this one, we were really thinking of uh, just dogs. Um, and we really didn't have any humans in mind. Um, but um, but usually I do. I mean these are these are these are all people who I've written uh, specific parts for. Um, yeah, just in this case, uh, this this one was an exception. And did you like give them a lot of freedom in the recording? Because that's way before you do any animation. You're not really committing to anything. Do you rewrite with them there or? How yes. Well, this one we had the the first recording session we had. Uh, Bob was there and Bill was there. Brian Cranston and Edward Norton. It was that little group, and um, 
it's really like a kind of uh, re like a rehearsal that you could, that you know you you can use everything. Uh, we we just sort of turn on the microphone when everybody uh, arrives and keep it kept it rolling for two days, and um, you know a anything can become a part of it. Um, it's a very it's a really free kind of way to work. Would it, does, does that do you think that's an accurate description? Yes, you couldn't put it any better than that. I don't think. <laughs> Bill, you obviously hate working with Wes Anderson. Is there, is there a particular movie that he may come to you with that you would say, Wes usually means yes, but today Wes means no, no, I'm not gonna do it. Is there anything like that, any kind of genre? That's a great question, Roro. Shit, Ro, I, Ro, I don't know. <clears throat> is, there, is there one we, that I would say no to? Yes, there is one. But if you say what it is, then you, you, know, then you get in trouble. <laughs> I'd rather the mystery of the refusal lay there just as the unknown, like, sorry, that's the one, hell no. They're, <clears throat> they're all fine to do. We have a lot of fun working together. The making of the movies with, with Wes has become the living of of a life of movies. It's really been a, a joy to be a part of. Good answer. <laughs> Konichi, how did you, how did you first we, meet Wes and how did you become a part of this process? I found out later that you actually became very important to the process to get it done the way it was. Um, I met Wes through Sophia. I work for Lost in Translation, where I met Bill. We did a karaoke together for a few hours, no? The guy sings like a bird, like an angel. Really. Um, then three years ago, Wes sent me an email. A short one says, I'm making a movie about Japan, and with your help. So I said yes. But help mean, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> and, you know, translating script or just voice over many Japanese characters because he wanted to pitch the length, I think. <coughs> then he said, my voice sounds pretty evil mayor. So he, <laughs> he said he would keep me. Then, you know, we did so many things, you know. Like we make a well, you know, is you, like your voice is lower than you expect it to be in relation to your person. I think. <laughs> um, Kun has told me that when he was in high school, he had there was a girl that he was dating, trying to date, but when he would call her, the father wouldn't allow him to speak to her because he thought he was in his forties, <laughs> um, and uh, he True. was forbidden. Yeah. Um, but you spoke, you did make it a bit lower. You were going for Toshiro Mifune. I mean, you can turn it on. I'm not gonna ask you to do it here, but he can go pretty deep with it. Yeah, but always was asked to speak faster and more aggressive, you know? Like every time I recorded my voice and I thought it's okay. Excuse me, could you a little quicker? <laughs> 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 anyway, I recorded <coughs> and sent it to Wes, but Wes is like, oh, I really like, but can you speak faster, uh, louder? So I don't know how many times I record and send it to you. We, we did pretty many, no? Yeah, well, the, the originally we recorded, originally, uh, we Kun did all the voices for, for our kind of um, storyboard version of the movie. I did the English-speaking voices, Kun did the um, Japanese-speaking voices, and um, I replaced every other voice that he did except for the, the mayor, which we, we could never do better than what Kun did, so thank you for thank that. Thank you. It's so ambitious, you know, the size and the scope of it. Did you get to... When you bring them in, did you already have something to show them of what it was going to look like, or what did you what did you have to show, or when, at what point did they see what they were actually making? 
I think we did have a little bit. I, I think when we were first recorded, we had some little short uh, bits of the animatic, which is the storyboard thing, as you know. Um, uh, and, um, but, you know, a, a very rough, uh, and, and not the whole movie. Eventually, with, with a movie like this, you know, you do the whole movie in, so, in a sort of previs. In our case, just very simple storyboards, but it is like the entire thing is uh, done that way, um, which is, I guess, is the normal thing for animated movies. They always do that, but it's a kind of a great system. Hey, Jeff, do you have a, an anecdote that, that you enjoyed on the film? I loved your character. Did, did, was it already like that? Did you, did you inform the character in some way, or did, was it... That was the part, and you just said, I'm playing that one. Did you assign parts, or did people just like, how did, how did that work? Because they seem to fit their personalities, their characters so well, or maybe it's just the way he spun it. I don't know. I, I could always pick you out, you know, just. just. Uh, thank you. Um, no, no. He, 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 Wes came to me with that ca character. And. Um, no, and my memory was that we didn't do much improvisation in the, I, I wasn't able to join the group. I did mine uh, um, in Los Angeles in a recording studio and Wes was on the phone. And I, I, th I, you know, I, I think it was very meticulously and beautifully already written. I think I just did the lines, we, you, know, you, you know, you directed me in the lines, but we, we just did the lines, we like, like that. We our barking and our noises. Oh yeah, little noises, yes, yes, <laughs> that's true. That's true. But seeing it tonight, wasn't it gratifying for, for, for you guys, for Wes? I'm, I'm curious. And, and you, you and you who really put the movie together, I, I didn't even know what it was. Because it, this audience, I feel like I saw, understood it for the first time through their eyes. And seeing it, I, and it works like gangbusters, I think. It's just not only a masterpiece, but it really is a, it's something. I really felt like I understood it, you know. Uh, you know, boy. I just loved it tonight. Didn't you? Didn't? Weren't you thrilled seeing it? Because you, you, you saw it tonight, and you saw it tonight, and you saw it tonight. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, I saw it. I saw it too. We, we were at the bar, Bill and I. Bill and I left. Yeah, and I, I, I saw it too. It, no, this is a. Yeah, I mean, this is probably the only time I will ever see it, because I don't think it will be as good again. Um, so. The Austin, my, Texas my, crowd, right my, here. I, I never. I. I never leave home without them. This is it. We're going to take some questions from the audience that are standing over here. How about you first? Hi. Good. good. Um, so you're actually one of my favorite directors ever. Um, so thank you so much. That film was amazing. Thank you. Um, I wrote my question down because I can't articulate it properly. But anyway. Ma'am, um, so it's a microphone. Use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you filmed Moonrise Kingdom near my university in Rhode Island. Um, and we actually uh, had some leftover film that you gave my, well, my professor ended up with, so we actually shot a short on it last semester, so thank you for that. Oh, good. Um, You're welcome. But I'm really intrigued with how you use color and symmetry as a visual um, component to tell your story, so I'm actually shooting in my film next week, and I'm using your films as an example for that, so I was just wondering, what's your favorite sort of um, color and, and that you use in your films to convey your messages and the symmetry you use um, and any of your films? Yes, well... Um, I think, in, you know, sometimes, uh, um, I, sometimes I've done a movie where there's sort of a plan of some color, uh, some color idea for what the movie ought to be. Um, uh, you know, Life Aquatic, we had a just, we had a lot of like aquamarine. Um, we had some of that blue polyester is what we had going there. Blue polyester, we had blue, wonderful yeah. blue polyester. The blue boat, blue, blue uniforms, red hats. Yeah, that was the color scheme. Um, this one, you know, this one, it was a more, it was a different thing because it, it was, we knew it was going to be a lot of garbage. And, um, what color is garbage? You know, it's, 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 it's all colors. Um, so we ended up, as we were sort of figuring out the sets, we ended up realizing that we needed our garbage to be very neatly organized and sort of split into, um, this is the part of the island where all the paper is, and here's where the sake bottles are. And um, I mean, it's slightly crazy, but that is how we uh, kind Give of- Give you a geography of some, yes. Yeah, it made like regions, yeah. it, because it's a sort of landscape. Um, I don't know if that's probably not exactly the answer you're looking for, but that was the, the, the you know, with, with this one, we didn't have a sort of color plan um, like I, I've had on some other ones. And it was more about, it was more about the geography of the garbage. Right. 
Thank you so much. Next question, and go, and go right to the questions. We... All right, uh, I'm so nervous, I'm gonna start talking like Jeff. Uh, uh, so my question... What's <laughs> that? <laughs> Say that, wait a second. Love you, Jeff. Wait anyway, my question is... Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm very, so sorry. Very, uh, very my, articulate. My my very question. articulate and intelligent, yes. Go ahead. Yes, very. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, my question is for Wes. Um, oh, my God, I forgot. Oh, my God. Uh, Jesus Christ, I'm so sorry. Um, I guess my question is, um, oh, my God, I am so, so sorry. All right, uh, uh, next question right over here. Thank you, sir. Uh, That's, I've, I've had that kind of thing happen to me before, though. You, you're really ready to, at, to say the thing. And yeah, I, 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 I had it. It'll I come had, to okay. you. We'll come back around right here. Thank you, so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I you just stand off question? to the side for now. I, Let the next person yeah. come to speak. Sir, sir, you might want to loosen that headband. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, so I have two questions, but I'll be really fast. Uh, so my first is, so like in, Fantastic, uh, like in Fantastic Mr. Fox, I love how your use of stop motion adds this uh, kind of quirky, odd feel to the movie. Uh, but I'm just wondering why particularly you choose to do stop motion. And my second question is, um, I have all your movies on Criterion. When is Grand Budapest Hotel coming out on Criterion? Because it's my favorite one. Like, see, but you see how he read his <laughs> question right off of there. Didn't matter, didn't have to remember anything. For the, re for the record, uh, I didn't forget my question for, for Steven Spielberg, just for the record. So my question oh. is, I'm so, no, no, not Wait like that, not like that, not like Wait that. A I, don't, I don't forget all my questions. You know what, it's I, his question right now I'm we're so doing. Sorry. I'm so sorry. The back about the Criterion Collection we're talking about. Um, we're working on, well, we, you know what, we're about to start working on that, I hope. I think we're, we're gonna, we definitely plan to do a Criterion Collection of uh, Grand Budapest, and, um, the f but the first part of the question was about stop motion, yeah, why choose it? Yeah. And the real thing with that was, um, I mean, I love stop motion, just as the whole medium, just the sort of textures of it and how it's done. Um, and I love what the animators who work in stop motion can do. They, 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 the, the way they can bring a, a character to life with, these, with the kind of puppets that we use, it's, it's kind of unique. I don't really know what other... Um, kind of sto movie storytelling is quite like it because they, they're they like sculpting um, and, and it's slowed down so much, it's, it's, it's mysterious. As closely as I've worked with uh, animators over the years, it's, I, I, you know, I couldn't even begin to do five seconds of a shot like that. Um, so, but the other thing was that uh, when we did our earlier animated movie, Jeremy, Jeremy Dawson and I, I mean, several people here were part of it, but uh, Jeremy and I worked on that together too, and um, we figured out such, it took us like a year to figure out how we, what our system was going to be for how to do this. A year is a long time to kind of not feel you've got it sorted out. And, but then we did kind of figure a good way to, to go about it. And so with this one, I uh, thought, well, right from the beginning, we have so many things already in place, how we'll be able to do it, because we're doing a bigger move, much, quite a bit bigger movie, similar kind of means. and. Um, and that was fun to kind of use our approach that we'd figured out, all our little systems and things. Kind of a long answer, but it gives him time to figure out whatever he's going to say next. Thank you. All right, so my question is, um, you've directed both stop motion and live action. As a director, what do you think is the main difference uh, directing a stop motion film uh, regarded, uh, compared to a live action film? Yes. Um, well. It's a good question. Um, Thank you. The, um, I think, um, you know, with, um, in terms of the, with working with actors, I, I think it's quite similar, except that when we're doing the stop motion, when we're doing, when you're just recording voices, it is just so completely uh, free, and it's really, you can really play with it any way you like, and, you know, you can use anything. That's a kind of unique thing. In terms of directing the whole process of stop motion. It's every, it, one thing is everything's out of order. You, you, you edit the movie before you shoot it. Um, and um, it's really, a, it's every, it's it, everything, the pace of things is all, is all changed. And, um, and also, on a live action movie, when you're shooting, you have this intense period, as you know, where you're really like, you know, your whole life is just, you know, every second on the set. And, um, 
and um, and you're doing one shot at a time, basically. I mean, you might have another another unit or something, but basically, it's it's linear. With a with a with a movie like this, you sometimes have sometimes we had twenty units, or what's the most we would have, Jeremy? How much? Forty. Forty. Only about twenty-seven shooting at the time, but we had forty units. <sighs> wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so see, that's a lot going on at once. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, that's a more, uh, th that could be, it's so, sort of a, a lower grade, it's, it's, the, it's a lower intensity, but it goes on a long, long time, and, um, and it's sort of on numerous fronts. Now, when you're recording their voices, I mean, each one of these guys has a very unique gestural quality when they talk. I mean, like Jeff, he talks and in, in, in his hand is out there doing some of the talking. <laughs> And here, do you, do you videotape them while they're, to, to get some of the gesture or facial expression or anything? Or is it Not, really you're going off voice and creating I mean, I new? Would, sometimes I always think, I, 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 I always wish I had later, but when we're actually doing it, I don't, I don't, I feel like I don't want to, I just want everybody to just be more, ju just be free. I don't want any camera there at all because that's the thing I kind of like about it is that there's, is nobody's watching. It's, uh, um, it's just the, it's like a radio play or something. So they're just listening to the voice, being inspired by the voice and creating the animation. And you then direct the expression they would have, the amount of you know, articulation a character would have. That's what I was curious about. Yeah, kind of, it's sort of like that. I mean, sometimes we'll do different little videos of an animator might film himself or I'll act something out right. and to give some basic idea. Some animators can work with the extreme subtlety of you, you, the, the most, uh, I mean, the most subtle facial expressions, they'll use that. Um, and then some animators, that's not really their, their thing. Um, so yeah, it gets sort of shaped like that. And also I think it, when we make the storyboards and those drawings, the, uh, some of the basics are, are there even in that probably. Right, right. Yes, sir. You had a massive ensemble cast in this movie, and I was wondering, how did you figure out who was going to voice who? And what was it like working with uh, Edward Norton and Harvey Keitel? Yes, good, y yes. Well, well, yeah, I mean, Edward, Edward Norton and Harvey Keitel, we'd, we'd done other, other movies together, too. And um, in fact, uh, Jeff and Bob and Bill, we, we've all done other movies together, some of uh, some, I mean, several. Um, and um, and how many have we done together? Eight or something? Bunches, bunches of bunches, <laughs> bunches. I think like eight movies. Um, and um, you, I'm sorry, I lost, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Where, uh, it was uh, Edward. It was great. Harvey was. I mean, the, the the thing with Harvey that was great was he 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 said. Um, when he was recording this scene, he said, "I want to try something. Just, just l let me try something." I said, well, you "Whatever, you try anything. Hard. Whatever, just, just, just let me try." And then he started doing this howling um, during the scene, <laughs> and um, it really completely changed the whole thing. I mean, he, he, he was, and also the other thing is he's he has a very strong sense of um, every part is on the same level. You put, you prepare for it, even if you're in one scene, which is basically what it is this, but you focus and you prepare and you go through whatever it was Stella Adler uh, taught him and everything. Um, and, um, and so he really arrived with this whole kind of uh, vision of what he was gonna play. And, um, and you know, that's a, it, you know, if you can have Harvey Keitel show up and uh, start howling and you know, you say, wow, <laughs> this is great. Um, so, it, you know, it really transformed the scene. And, and as he wrote it, and uh, his question was, how did you, with such a big cast, how did you start putting, I mean, when you, it's great when you have a repertory company like this, you can say, okay, well, I've got these actors, I know I want to work with them, they understand me, but how do you decide who goes where? Yeah, that I don't even know. I mean, I, 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 um, I think, um, I, you know, we did, there's a, we, we did a thing that um, is just all gone online where, the, where, where these guys all talk about their roles in the movie as their... The characters. As the characters, yeah. And in a way, I think what each had to say about the character is almost like a better answer for why they were in those parts. They kind of explain it. I mean, Bill had a very interesting thing about what a mascot is. Um, a mascot is somebody who, when, um, 
when things go badly, um, they're there to cheer you up and h help you. But when things go well, you really, really want them to be there to share that with you, um, which is an interesting take on the mascot. And, I, and that's, that's what you play, am I right? That's what I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you should look that up when you go home. There's an interview with them in character as the dogs talking about their characters like it's behind the scenes on the movie. It's really, it's really cool. Let's have this right over here. Uh, hi, Mr. Anderson. I'm a fan of your work. Mr. Murray, Mr. Goldblum, I'm, I'm a fan of y'all's work as well. Uh, Mr. Anderson, my question to you is, you said earlier that you wrote these characters uh, without any humans in mind, just dogs. So my question to you is, uh, did you like already predetermine the breeds of these dog characters in mind? Or did you leave that open to interpretation? And then when you casted the characters, uh, did you determine the breeds based off the voices of the actors? Yeah, we're getting like really into it. <laughs> uh, the breeds, the breeds were sort of, well, they, in the script, they were all mixed breeds, and I think that's what they're supposed to be in the movie, but they all, but you can, there's, the, the, the basic breed, the bra basic mixture is kind of in the script, um, but I don't know, I mean, it, also, uh, the, 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 the boss of the puppets department, his name is Andy Gent. He's kind of the, he's, he's in charge of, I, I, when we did Fantastic Mr. Fox, he was in charge of really taking care of all the puppets. On this movie, he was the one who started at the very beginning and he was really, the, he supervised every aspect of these puppets. And the way these pup, the dogs were designed started as sculpts that he, uh, you know, they, they weren't drawings, they were just clay uh, f figures first. And um, so really, um, it's, it kind of comes from Andy and uh, Andy's ideas and, um, and uh, his, his interpretation of what's in the script, what's in our conversations. And I think already what, the, what the, the voices were that we had recorded, what the actors did, shaped what, how we designed the puppets. Thank you. And affected the breeds. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I'm a huge fan of your work, um, but what inspired you to become a filmmaker? Um, well, that's a that's a that's kind of a tough one. Um, <laughs> you know, I remember. I mean, for me, the most uh, Im probably the most important time when I uh, of thinking about m wanting to make movies, it was while I was going to school here in Austin, um, and. Um, <laughs> I mean, it certainly is when, 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 when it, and, and also I, my, my friend here, my, uh, my roommate is Owen Wilson, so we started working together here on, a, on our first movie. Um, but it was really the, um, it was really the, 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 the PCL, is it still called the PCL, the Perry Castaneda Library? Yes. At the PCL, there was then a very, very big collection of movie books most of them were kind of old. They were, they, were, they were books about movies from the 70s, the 60s, like European cinema of the 60s, the Fellini and Antonioni and um, Bergman and uh, Truffaut and Godard, and 70s American movies. They had a lot of books like that. Um, and I wasn't in film school. You were in, you were in, you were in radio, television, film, and you were, your focus was already film. Um, because I saw your short films. Okay. Yes, yeah. Um, and um, um, but um, but yeah, it was really reading books, and then also there were a lot of um, at like at the uh, Fine Arts Library they had uh, laser discs in those days that you could watch, and there was there was a library of movies you could watch. Plus, I also was a projectionist uh, at uh, the Union uh, Cinema, and in, in those days, Hogg Auditorium we showed 35 millimeter at Hogg Auditorium. I wasn't really, I wasn't considered a good projection. I don't want to. I mean, if we had, if the if the if the supervising projectionist was here, he might say you weren't really a projectionist, or I don't totally believe that, but I was. Yeah, that was a very exciting time because you could tell this independent, a new wave of independent film was about to happen. So you kind of got swept up at it at that time. You could just tell the times. We're, we're circling back around. Yeah, I even remember um, Owen and I, uh, Owen and I li we lived not so far from Mad Dog and Beans, which was a place that probably not very many people here would remember. You can see how little reaction. But uh, we saw, um, 
uh, Rick Linklater filming Slacker on a street right next to there. We didn't know what it was, but we re when we saw, then we saw the movie at Dolby uh, Cinema, and, um, and we realized that was the thing we saw that day. We saw them shoot this thing. Um, Things were really exploding right then. Yes, yeah. that's right. It feels like that wave is coming back. You guys, write it, write it. Right here. Um, so I've grown up watching both Wes Anderson's movies and Bill Murray's movies. And, you know, most of the time I know that when you're working on the movie yourself, you know how the movie is going to end. But I was wondering, like, how does that like affect your your kind of emotion behind the movie as in like your emotion tied to the characters and stuff? Very interesting. That's good for the actors, I think, to talk about. Am I right? How how you're emotionally affected, really like how this how the this the story that you're playing is affecting you. Bob's very good with the questions. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I would say in this movie, I had no idea what the movie was doing. <laughs> and when I, it really wasn't until, well, I saw it in Berlin, but when I saw it tonight, I'm sure it had something to do with this audience and the fact that we hadn't just flown for 79,000 hours before I saw the movie. But tonight I went, this is an amazing movie because even though I hung on every word, the life in the movie was literally, it could have been in my favorite way, and the story was critical, but I thought it could have been a silent movie. I knew so much from watching this thing that it was kind of thrilling. I mean, even if, even if the sound had been turned off, the characters lived because of the way they moved and the timing of everything and the music it was so powerful, a visual experience. That I, did, I, I was just amazed. I thought, I'm glad I didn't know about this because it would have been intimidating. Yeah, uh, that's good. You know, it, there, there's an interesting thing, too. So, you know, the, the, um, the actors, sometimes, the, you know, these dogs, they don't talk all the time. There's a lot of behavior that's, that, that's, that is not the, inspired by their voices. Uh, but the voices are they establish the characters so much that to me I feel like I feel the actors in the in the performances of the puppets whether they're talking or not all through the through the movie we, I think we felt that all all through the period of animating the movie and kind of uh, the whole making of the movie it, it, it's an odd thing they get sort of infused into the puppets somehow thank you thank I'm you um, thanks for answering. I'm sure you've had that question asked to you a million times. <laughs> no, that was that. that no, very that was good a, question. That was a good, very good question. question. And also, you know, it seems like a strange thing, you know, to to put that much trust. Like I said, he didn't really know. It's an animated film. You're not going to really know till it's done what you're what you're going into. But it's testament to just the the work of this collective. You know, this work of this world that Wes has built around himself. That He's built a group of people that come to him and know they trust him, he trusts them, and they go with this vision, they commit to what's handed to them in paper, and they bring life to it, and it all works like magic. And it's because of the trust that goes on with this group. I was up here last year with Edgar Wright and Baby Driver, and I'm gonna say the same thing I said back then, which was, you saw the movie, it's a big screen experience, you want other people to have this experience. Marketing can never buy the word of mouth that you guys give. Go out and make this a hit like you did that one. Go out and tell people to come see this movie because it's a bold, visionary work by Wes and his artistic collective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. That's so nice of you.